Sween, Mid Argyll, Scotland, is a tranquil sea loch, and its name originates from the Max Sween or Clan Sweeney, which means well disposed or pleasant in Scottish Gaelic. Nestled within a safeguarded national nature reserve, amidst the captivating hills of Napdale and a rare ancient temperate rainforest. When in this neck of the woods, the fairy isles at the head of Loch Sween might be one of the first places we think of in reference to the otherworldly, the good people, the sheep. As we sweep over the top of this striking temperate rainforest, we note, however, that this isn't our final stop today, but rather another area of the loch. To learn more, we're going to open a copy of The Kist, the magazine of the Natural History and Antiquarian Society of Mid Argyll. Issue number 21 of Spring 1981, written by D.M. Hooten and A.T. Lewis. South of the gate that gives access down to Castle Sween, the road to Kilmory Knapp continues along the hillside without much variation for the next two miles. If the road itself is rather dull here, the views from it become more and more spectacular. Looking back, Castle Sween on its rocky knoll on the shore occupies the foreground, and Loch Sween stretching back into the hills of North Knapdale KNAP, provides a scene that in storm or calm, sun or rain, summer green or the rich golden browns of winter, is never twice the same. Westward, the road overlooks the narrowest part of the loch and the lowland beyond, which here is the island of Dana, though it is joined to the mainland by a causeway. The little fields, copses and rough ground take a lovely pattern of colour as a foreground for the mountains of Jura across the sound, which now begin to show west of Dana. There is a good strip of fertile land, and here are a number of ruined cottages in two groups. This is Doid. In former times, there must have been a good many people living here. Now, only one of the old houses is still in use. At the seaward side of the area is a smooth hump of rock which falls away to the loch side as a splintered cliff and when the fern and bracken have died in winter from among the many massive fallen slabs, it is clear to see that this place was used as a quarry for flat stones for doorsteps and lintels. Archaeologists and geologists are now certain that this site provided the stone for many of the crosses and grave slabs carved in Mid Argyll centuries ago. This green strip ends in a sandy bay. Good crops must have been grown at Doid a century ago, and John McTaggart, the weaver of Knapp, told us how the boats came from Northern Ireland to buy potatoes here. We first met John in the late 1920s. He said he was 88 then, and he lived for another four years. He told us much about the district and impressed upon us children then how every place had its own name and its story. We remember much of what he told us, and often wish we'd had the chance to learn more from him. It is the next account the authors give that is of real interest. In the 1950s, John McTaggart's nephew Dougal, who spent a good deal of time at Knapp after he retired, 
told our parents another tale about Doid. This concerns the small, steep rock face at the east roadside, just at the start of the hill going on to Kilmory Nap. There is an old milestone there on the left, just an upright slab of stone about two feet high, 18 miles, it reads, to Loch Gilpad. The numbers were still painted on it in the 1920s, but never renewed since. Almost above this, the rock formation looks like a doorway. There is a flat lintel and a recess below with the appearance of door jams on either side. All is rather overgrown now with grass and scrub, but it is possible to imagine it cleared and then quite impressive. This is called the Door Nashi, the Door of the Fairies, and is a way into the hill for the good people who dwell there, story says. A tradition exists that they, capital T, are sometimes heard singing. Dougal, John McTaggart's nephew, admitted that he had once heard them and that he had known others who had. He thought that it rarely happened. You have to be right and the time has to be right, he said. The occurrence had evidently made a great impression on him. The article continues. When my mother told me about this tale, I felt quite queer about it, as my mind at once returned to a strange winter dusk early in 1941, when I was living at Kilmory Nap with two tiny children evacuated from the south. It was a Sunday and I had a lift four miles along the road to Craig Madai Farm to get my baby's milk, which came on weekdays by post fan. The light was fading, I remember, as I walked home past Doid and heard an odd sound, like a short cadence of notes every now and then. I kept stopping to hear it better. Then there was silence. But as soon as I moved on again and my footsteps were sounding once more on the road, I'd hear it again. I could not make it out. It seemed in the air without direction, a far sound yet coming from nowhere. I think I must have heard it 20 or 30 times while I walked that piece of road. And I am sure that after I passed that rock, that doorway, and went on up the hill, I heard it no more. It puzzled me at the time, but I had no one to ask about it, and I forgot. It was 10 or 12 years later that I heard about the door in the hill and of the singing, and instantly I thought about that evening again. There may be an explanation. I've tried to find one, but have failed to do so. Of one thing I am certain, that what I heard was the same sound that gave rise to the legend, if I may call it that. It is a lasting regret that I never had a chance to tell Dougal what I had heard or to ask him about it myself. I've been back in the district a good many years now, but that hillside has remained silent and the door locked very firmly shut, bolted and barred against the noises of internal combustion engines. 